The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Because if you have not had that experience where there's something in your story that flips that switch in you, where achieving feels like oxygen, if you go too long, you feel like you can't breathe, then it can look from the outside like, okay, you grew up in a trailer, but you went to Yale Law. So the only side effect was success. Like, what are you complaining about? But what I say is the side effect, the whole disease, is not knowing how to stop. Moving from performing for your worth to purpose in God's calling, next. Hi, welcome to Life Today. I'm Sheila Walsh here with Randy Robeson. And I have to tell you, I'm very excited about our guest today. Um, I first heard about Mary Morantz quite some time ago because she's with the same book company as I am. But her first book that came out was called Dirt, and it was powerful. But she has a brand new one. It's called Slow Growth equals strong roots. Mary, it's such a joy to welcome you to the program. Oh my gosh. Sheila, Randy, uh, both of you guys, thanks so much for having me. And Sheila, I feel like we've been friends forever, I but it's too. just like <laughs> a couple years through Instagram, but thank you Amen. for having me. Yeah. Before we go into this beautiful devotional, honestly, it's one of the, the most beautiful books you will ever see, the artwork, the photography, but the very first book that you wrote, mm. Dirt. Can you give just a kind of synopsis of, yeah. of where you started in life? Yeah, um, so basically the short version, the elevator pitch version, if it were, um, is I grew up in a single wide trailer in, born in 1980, uh, in the 80s. So the trailer was purchased in like 1978 and surprising to no one, single wide trailers in 1970s, 1980s were not built to last. Oh. But that is where I grew up from zero to 18 and so about halfway through the ceiling starts leaking, um, aided in no small part from eight-year-old Mary climbing onto the roof and sliding down <laughs> it in the rain. Uh, so I take some responsibility, but it started to you know, leak and the water would pour through and then the floor would start to cave in. We had mushrooms growing out of the floor at one point. And I always say like my people are the people who know what drywall ceiling looks like right before it gives way uh, wow. in a downpour. And so elevator pitch is grew up in a trailer and then went to Yale Law School. And I feel like we've seen that movie. We've read that book, but it is the story that God gave me. And for me to walk into a market where there's already a lot of stories like that, I just asked myself, what does it look like for me to tell the truth in this situation? And I felt like that story through the lens of grace was a different approach, a different voice. So, yeah. Now, now this was in West Virginia? That's right. Yes. Yeah. What was... So we know what the trailer was like, and mm. so if poverty in West Virginia is, mm. what was the environment like? Yeah, you know, Randy, that is an amazing question and a very, a very smart question because one of the things I've learned through this process is that there are a lot of different kinds of poverty, and so I think I probably had poverty of house, but I never had poverty of love, and I have friends who had poverty of they weren't sure when the next meal was coming, but they were in a nice double wide. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there's a lot of different um, angles to that and a lot of different sides to that. And so, you know, I had um, parents who loved me and, and um, my grandma Goldie was right next door, who's quite the character. <laughs> so I, I feel like that story could have gone a lot differently, yeah, sure. but for a family's love, yeah. yeah. What about your own, your faith journey? Mm. You know, you talk about quite an early age, like kind of, raising up your face yeah. to God in the sky. What was your faith journey like as a young person? Yeah, I feel like, I don't, I don't, I can't explain it except to say I feel like God started talking to me at a very young age. And I don't remember at that age ever having been told, this is how you talk to God. I, ha I was not yet going to Sunday school. I didn't know how to read scripture. I didn't know how, like the prayers you were supposed to pray. This was a conversation with a friend. And I say in the book, it felt like he drew close enough to leave fog marks on the glass. And later he started meeting me in the daylight hours and he was in the sun on your face when you close your eyes and the birds stepping off the branch, the feel of dirt on your hands, how you can't shake it once you know what it feels mm -hmm. like. He was color and freedom and fire and dirt. And so it was a very pure relationship. And then I went through a phase when I was a teenager thinking, 
God is a distant God. Mm. God is a God who has favorites and we're not it. Mm. You have to earn your worth, your approval with God. And so it was like a journey really far from him to only find my way back home, which is wow. a lot of what dirt is about. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Is Yale Law School a, a, a long distance from West Virginia? <laughs> you know, for, In a lot of ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, did, how yeah. did you make that jump and why did you go to that direction? Yeah, uh, gosh, wow, uh, what, it's such a great question because um, my dad was very insistent that I was gonna get out mm. and I was gonna go to college. He went to work in the woods when he was 12 wow. and he had a very hard life and he could see that we were on the same trajectory. We were growing up in the same yard, we went to the same Sunday school, we went to the same elementary school and so he was like, you're going to college. But for him getting out was West Virginia University, which is where I did my undergrad mm -hmm. and then stop. Mm -hmm. go, go up to the boundaries, go up to the border. And so there's this line in dirt about the undulating irregular heartbeat that is the border of West Virginia. And I found out and told him I was gonna go do a year in England the week after 9-11. So he was not pleased, yeah. he was yeah. not pleased. And so there was tension there. He did not want me to go to school outside of the state. He said, go to West Virginia University Law School. Like if yeah. people keep leaving the state, how, how are we gonna make that better? And so. I, but that transition at WVU is what showed me the world. I was on the debate team. We were debating political issues of the world. We were traveling for tournaments. And that was the first time my eyes were open to a life outside of the state. Mm. So yes, it is a world away in a lot of ways. It's a lot of different backgrounds compared to mine. And um, Yale is the number one law school, contrary to what Elle El Woods would have you believe. It's not Harvard, <laughs> it, it is Yale. Um, and. Uh, in a lot of ways, I sort of felt like that fish out of water, not because of anything anybody else did, but just you walk in with that chip on your shoulder. And now you have this great new devotional, yeah. Slow Growth Equals Strong Roots, so a fantastic title, Thank Finding you. Grace, Freedom, and Purpose in an Overachieving World. Yeah. One of the devotions struck me, ah, man. I remember when I was in college, I was 19 and I was dating the guy who was head of the tennis team, he was kind of the catch. And I'd always felt bad about my skin. I had bad skin when I was a teenager. Yeah. And I brought a book back to him one morning and he opened the door and the sun was on my face. And he said to me, gosh, I must really love you because you look terrible right now. Wow. And that picture stayed with me every time I met anybody else. Yeah. I thought that's what they're thinking. Mm -hmm. And you talk about that, about walking into a room yeah. and you have a picture that you think people are seeing. Yes, 100%. Uh, it, you know, I say in this book, not many people can pinpoint the exact moment you go from cute kid <laughs> to the awkward, ugly girl, but I have photographic evidence. And it was, um, it was the 1980s, so big, big hair perm, kinky curly, uh, <laughs> with the like Venus flytrap bangs. And um, so one of the things I really noticed when I look at this picture is these muddy shoes, because I feel like even though you're trying to do this thing where you chemically alter the lot in life you've been given in the form of your hair, there's still that dirt and that mud with you and you carry that with you. And so I'm down in this pose that nobody asked me to pose in with like my elbows on my knees, holding up my chin, probably because the hair was so big. <laughs> and um, that picture just became for me the epitome of you are the ugly girl. This is what anytime, it doesn't matter how far you go, how grown up you are, how much you straighten that hair, that's, that's all people see. And it's so incredible how each of us have that version that we feel like is walking into the room and introducing us. And before we can sit down at a table, she's already been uninvited. Or I don't, I'm, maybe Randy can speak to this. I don't know, he has already been uninvited. And we just, we have no idea how other people see us or how God sees us until we really start to lean into, when I'm walking into a room, what does it look like for him to be the one to introduce me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what, do you, what do you do with that picture? Do you, do you yeah. embrace it or do you run from it? Well, I've spent a lifetime running from it. So I've done the field research and I can tell you it doesn't work. <laughs> um, and now when I look at that girl, it's, that's like the proof to me of how much change has happened because I have nothing but like, compassion for her and I think she's the coolest. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you one of the craziest things that happened is um, when I wrote Dirt, my husband and I were known for black and white photography and just like really sophisticated Vanity Fair, moody kind of a look. And after I released Dirt into the world, I could not get enough color. Like punky Brewster, rainbow color. And I felt like Little Mary was like, finally, 
finally, you're not going to like run away from me. And in slow growth, one of the prayers I talk about, I had this just like mic drop, knock the wind out of you moment with God, where I was talking about these illusions in the distance, these perfect imaginary versions of yourself that you think if I can just catch up to her, then I'll be happy, then I'll be safe. And she turns at you, looks down at you from her lofty positions on high, these illusioned illuminated mountaintops in the distance, looks you straight in the eye that are mirror reflections of her own for only a minute, smiles a superior smile and goes on without you. And the prayer's talking about this heartbreak of you're chasing somebody who keeps leaving you and that person is you. Mm -hmm. And I realized in that moment, I had been doing the same thing to little Mary yeah. for my whole life. So now I kind of picture like all these different versions of me coming back together to sit together and they're at peace, they're playing. I love yeah. that, I yeah. love that. The word on your cover that really stuck out to me is the word overachieving. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We live in a world where it's like, it's never enough, we're mm. never enough. And I have to tell you, when I'm out spending time with women, I hear that over and over. I'm not enough, I'll never yeah. be enough. Mm -hmm. Why was that so important to write about for you? Yeah, oh wow. Well, they say write the book, you think you set out to write a book to help other people, but it's really to, <laughs> yes. really to help yourself. <laughs> the wish you could read. Um, yes. Yeah. So I am very much, I very much identify as that. Like I have on my website, like it's like Jesse Spano meets like Elle Woods, like what, like it's hard, A++ overachiever. But one of the really interesting things for me in releasing this book and talking to women is we start off, it's still in the manuscript. I describe her as the most put together woman in the room. But once I started having conversations, what I heard from women is that they are so relentlessly hard on themselves, they don't even feel qualified to call themselves overachievers. They don't even feel qualified to call themselves the most put together. And so we had to kind of pivot into the woman always performing. Mm. Because even if you couldn't say like, oh yes, I am an overachiever, you know what it's like to feel like you always have to be on. Mm. So that's a really interesting twist that this book is for the woman who's so hard on herself she can't even imagine calling herself an overachiever. Yeah. Performer is an interesting word, though. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I spent so much of my early Christian life performing. Yeah. Trying to be good enough for God. Yeah. And it was only when my life kind of fell apart mm. that I discovered it actually was safe to take the mask off in the presence of God. Yeah. Has there been like a turning? I mean, was there a point in your life where something just shifted? Yeah. So the book, a really interesting thing about these two books, they are very much fraternal twin sisters. They mm -hmm. do not look alike, and that was on purpose. Dirt is a love letter to the girl in the trailer. This one is a love letter to the girl after the trailer who has put on this very beautiful life that you would never imagine that dirt is what is right. the inside. And so the fascinating thing is that one of the last entries in Dirt, it talks about at a certain point you stop running, breathless and at last exhausted, you double over from a pain, the pain of a lifetime spent proving, but no matter how hard you run, you can't outrun you. Well, I thought that was the end of this journey of making peace with your past. And I turned that book in and we send it off and God's like, cool, that's actually gonna be the start of the second book. Mm. And so that passage in the book, it actually says, this is the inciting incident at last exhausted. And so the pivot, the mm. turning point for me is, I think every single person watching, you almost have to taste it for yourself. You almost have to try for yourself to achieve your way into worth. Check the box, check the box, one more box, 10 more boxes, and reach that point where you're finally going, okay, so maybe no amount of more is ever gonna make me feel stop feeling less than. So if you're starting to feel at last exhausted, if you're starting to feel like, I'm ready to stop running from this story, then I think you're ready for this book, yeah. I I, I, like, I love the writing, by the way. Thank uh, you. The pictures that you, you draw, they really help, I think, communicate what you're trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. There is one more that I would love to hear you relate uh, because you talk about the running. Mm -hmm. You talk about sometimes what you're running from. Yeah. And the yeah. realization. Explain that, that yeah. the wolf. Yeah, the wolf. Oh, the wolf. <laughs> uh, so in Dirt, it was very important to me in Dirt and then again in this book, to really communicate to people how primal, visceral survival achieving for your worth can be. Because if you have not had that experience where there's something in your story that flips that switch in you, where achieving feels like oxygen, if you go too long, you feel like you can't breathe, then it can look from the outside like, okay, you grew up in a trailer, but you went to Yale Law, so 
the only side effect was success. Like, what are you complaining about? <laughs> but what I say is the side effect, the whole disease, is not knowing how to stop. Mm. And so to, ex to really kind of show that picture, I talk about the girl in the red cape escaping her way out of the deep dark woods. The big bad wolf is ripping at her heels, these branches clawing at her clothes and her skin, leaving a trail of breadcrumbs behind her. At a certain point, breathless and wide-eyed, she looks back over her shoulder and she says, I say, I am the girl in the red cape, but I'm also the wolf. And that voice in my head saying, you have to keep running in order to be safe, is my own. And so in slow growth, one of my favorite things is we revisit that scene, this time from the perspective of the wolf. Mm. And you find out that the wolf is not bad, the wolf is wounded, and there's a thorn in its paw. And at a certain point, we learned how to cage it and made it dance in our three ring circus where we always get to be the high wire act because if it stops chasing us, we might stop running. And if we stop running, we might cease to exist or to matter. And so we twist the thorn, we know the wounds, the pressure points to hit to send it back into fight or flight mode. But when it roars in pain, our throats hurt. And when we twist the thorn, our once unscarred wide open palms are the ones that bleed. And so it is this piece of, I had to become these different versions, this wild animal version of myself to survive. And when we can bring them all back together, that's when I think we start to have peace with the past and, and the wholeness. story. Uh, I hear and wholeness. wholeness, wholeness, yes. Mm -hmm. There was this like reintegration mm -hmm. for sure, yeah. I found it interesting um, reading that like your dad didn't come to your graduation at Yale. Yeah. He felt he would not fit in. Yeah. And perhaps one of the things that worried him throughout his life was he would have nothing, no legacy to leave you. Mm -hmm. But you talk about, I mean, you talk about his hands yeah. and you talk about your life being the legacy mm. that he left you. Yeah. Oh, Sheila, I don't know if I can even talk about that. You're gonna make me cry. Um, yeah, he is, it's so easy for him to look um, 12 years old, goes to the woods, trailer. He's reaching a point quickly that he's not gonna be able to log anymore and that's breaking his heart. Um, and so I think like he can start to feel like all I've done my whole life is cut things down and like mm -hmm. mow things over, you know? Um, and he, like when I was younger, he got asked by the um, governor to be the one to cut down these very long trees to build this, rebuild this covered bridge that had burned down in West Virginia. And he was like, that's really the only thing I can like point to when I'm gone. And the whole time I'm like sitting before him like, hello, like, hello, <laughs> I'm right here. Yeah. Um, and I just don't think he can fully understand. And so at the end of Dirt, I talk about most people hear a story like Trailer to Yale Law and they get interested in the upward explosion of mobility. And for me, I got interested in the spark that came before. Mm -hmm. And like, that's what sets off that explosion. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I know, we've barely gotten into this. <laughs> There's gonna, so much more. I know, yeah. I mean, honestly, um, obviously I would encourage you to, to get hold of Dirt. It's a great book, but this book, Slow Growth Equals Strong Roots, there is something in here that will make a shift in every single one of us. And I wanna tell you how you can get hold of your own copy. But first of all, Randy and I would really love to ask you to help us with something that we care passionately about. And that is that there are some people that are scratching through the dirt, even as we speak, trying to find some access to something that would be drinkable. And it's a very futile search, but we have discovered that we can make a difference. Would you watch this and then I'll tell you how you can get hold of Mary's brand new book. One hundred hours. On average, that's how long the human body can survive without water. In the face of death by dehydration, water like this is the only choice for many. Recently, while in East Africa, we spoke with Fatina, a mother personally impacted by this crisis. Unclean water is a common hardship throughout the world. And when something is common, it's easy to get used to. 
But should losing a child ever be something we get used to? Contaminated water has already taken Fatina's son. In Cambodia, Sam Nang lost his daughter to a waterborne illness. Miriam Van Edges from Central America stands by the grave of her five-month-old baby boy who died from drinking contaminated water. It came from this river, the only source Miriam has available to her. His death still haunts Miriam to this day, knowing clean water could have prevented it. For years, you've helped Life Outreach provide clean water in thousands of areas across the globe. Right now, mothers like Fatina also need clean water in their villages before tragedy strikes again. It's almost inconceivable to me to think that in this day and age that this is still happening, mm -hmm. that children are dying simply because they have no access to clean water. Can you imagine what it's like to actually live beside your killer? I mean, water should be the source of life. But for so many that Randy and I have had the privilege of sharing a little of their journey with them and hearing their stories, you know, the thing that's hard to understand unless you go there is that so many of these moms, like Fatina, get up at like four o'clock in the morning and they will walk and walk and walk until they come to the only thing that's available, either a, a dirty contaminated river or a hand dug well. Those go down about six feet and neither is a source of healthy water. And can you imagine what it's like as a mom to give your remaining children the very thing that took the life of your son. It's unthinkable. And that's why here we are determined, as long as there is breath in our bodies, we're going to do something about it. And our commitment this year, Randy, is for 350 wells that will provide water in 20 nations. And if you would just join with us, we can do this. Yeah, we absolutely can. And we know because we have done it in the past, many of you have supported this. And we thank you for that. And you know, Sheila, these people are doing the best they can. You see them in these desperate situations. They're, sometimes they don't know how bad the water is until it's too late. They're, they're doing what they can. But you and I have both seen what happens when they get the fresh, clean water well. When that well goes in, we see how it transforms them. Yeah. I mean, I remember one day being in a village and walking with a mom to where she had buried her little one and she, could, she couldn't stand. I mean, she literally, she was just, I just held her, she was sobbing. And the next day we drove for hours and hours to a place where we've already drilled a well. And there the children were happily pumping this sparkling clean water and handing me a cup in their grubby little cup. But it was beautiful, clean water. It is. It, it literally transforms the village when we go in and we put a well in. And, and here's how it works. On average, an average well, when you look at the 350 wells, we're going to drill over 20 nations. The average well costs $4,800. If you can give a well, do it. You will transform typically about the lives of a 1,000 people. Fresh, clean water for a thousand people for $4,800. It's, it's that simple. Now, many of you, uh, maybe $48 is what you can give, and that will transform the lives of 10 people. Give them fresh, clean water. $144 today will help provide clean drinking water for 30 people for a lifetime. I'm suggesting you go online or go to the phone right now and give the best gift you can and let's turn it around for these people. We do it in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He said, whoever will give a cup of water in my name, it, it will not go unnoticed. Your gift today will not go unnoticed. It will go to good use. So join us as we give water for life. Go to the phone, go online, give the best gift you can, do it now. Across the globe, hundreds of thousands of lives are lost each year to waterborne disease, and nearly half of those are children under the age of five. Through Mission Water for Life, you can give mothers hope and children a future as we provide clean, life-giving water for thousands of children and their families before it's too late.
With your gift today, you could help drill and establish 350 water wells this year. Your gift of $24 will help provide clean water for five children. A gift of $48 will help provide for 10. $72 will provide for 15. And $144 will help provide life-giving water for 30 people for a lifetime. With your gift of any amount, we'll send you the God's Daily Promise devotional set. These four seasonal devotionals each contain a daily scripture, inspirational message, and room to journal your prayers and insights from God's Word. With your gift of $100 or more, please request the Faith, Hope, and Love coaster set. All four beautiful sandstone coasters come in an elegant natural wood holder and artistically display the words of 1 Corinthians 13:13. 13, 13. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,200 to help provide water for 250 people or a gift of $4,800 to help sponsor a complete well, and you may request our inspiring bronze sculpture, Let the Children Come. Please call, write, or make your gift online. Be a part of giving water and life today. Go online, or go to the phones, give the best gift you can. And when you do today, with any gift, you can request this wonderful book. And by the way, Sheila, I took this little quiz, I, I, these, you know, it was like 60 seconds, quick quiz, and they're supposed to, ex she, Mary, you know, thought she had me figured out. <laughs> and I did it, and she nailed it. <laughs> really? Nailed it. I couldn't believe it. Well, so let me tell you, re request for any gift, your copy of this book, but then go online. It's, it's achieverquiz.com. Yeah. Um, so if you had to guess, Mary, what would you say I was? Well, my first guess was the performer, because I am also a performer. Um, and for the perf so with each of the types, there are five different types that you can get as a result, and it depends on how achieving goals makes you see yourself and how achieving goals makes other people see you. And so for me, with my story, it was very important to hit the goals and have other people see how far I had come. And I feel nice. like we're very similar, so that would be my guess. But you, but we were talking, and you said it was like surprising. So there could be a masquerader second runner. That's what I came oh. out as, the masquerader. Wow, she's I good. Oh, yes, she's you're very good. good. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> you take the test yourself and do let us know how it goes. Mary, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And we will see you next time on Life Today. Mm, Thank you. God bless you. There has never, ever, ever been a greater time for you and I to run, to run in the direction of Jesus. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.